30 years have come and gone since Time Magazine put a computer on the front cover as their man of the year. That's right, and you might be watching us right now on a computer or maybe a mini computer we carry around in our pockets every day. So we wanted to find out how far computers have come. For this full circle report, we sent ABC Action News reporter Michael Paluska to the University of Florida, where he got an exclusive tour of one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. Hypergator processes data beyond our wildest dreams, keeping it running as impressive as the computational power itself. I want to show you two generations of uninterruptible power supply. Eric Domans, the senior director for research computing at the University of Florida, gave us a tour. This box on the left here is the actual generator that generates a megawatt of electricity. Showing us the fail safes and backups, locomotive sized diesel generators, battery power banks, a massive air conditioning system that recirculates air through the entire data center twice a minute. Temperatures constant at 61 to 62 degrees. If there's no cold water to keep cooling it, the machine room will overheat in four minutes. That low growl evokes noises from sci-fi movies. It is deafening during peak demand as loud as a jet engine. This GPU is actually working overtime right now because someone is running a process code through for the artificial intelligence system. My watch is picking up about 91 decibels. These computers get their entire life perfect current. And the temperature is also current, also always the same. As a result, the machines live very long. It takes three days to reboot, time that would cripple students and researchers across the state. For those computer geeks out there, these numbers are for you. Hypergator has more than 70,000 cores and 1,120 GPUs. What that means is that something that might have taken 10 years for you to process and crunch the data for, now using Hypergator, will only take a researcher seven days. As revolutionary as the computer was back in 1983 when Time Magazine put it on their cover, that system is nothing but a dinosaur today. And while yesterday's tech is today's junk, every computer piled up over the years led us to this moment. We're at a point now where computers are extremely smart. I mean, is this computer smarter than a human being or is it just using our brains and our technology to calculate what we need faster? Computers are not smarter. We're actually using the wrong words because computers are just good at doing the manual or the, the sort of repetitive tasks that humans take a lot of time to do. Yeah, so from this is a T1 anatomical scan, structural T1 MRI. Yeah, that's from the camera. It's, the camera is clicking, it's capturing images. We met with two different researchers in two very different fields, harnessing this power for good. So really, this research could save lives because it could give answers to people that are suffering from Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, maybe a cure faster than they thought they could get it? I think that's a goal of our research. It is still in the research stage. Dr. Rul Gu Feng is an associate professor in the biomedical engineering department. Her focus is on brain health. Her research uses artificial intelligence to learn from trillions of data points in brain scans, searching for any clues to one day uncover a medical breakthrough. I think acceleration in computing is not just about faster computing. It's about saving people's lives, giving hope to the medicine, and accelerating human knowledge and intelligence. On a farm in Waimama, assistant professor Dr. Kevin Wong is taking plant photography to another level. It's got six cameras on it. Every second it takes six photos. They have to map this entire field to put it into a 3D model. And without that computer, none of this is possible. We do this data collection weekly. So you can imagine like every week we generate two, three terabyte of data. But the more images we capture, the better 3D model we can build from those images. Wong tells me that 3D model will help growers sift through more than 3,000 varieties of strawberries. The data helping them answer a number of questions like when to harvest, what variety tastes the best, has the most fruit, 
or has the best growth in our climate? Is this artificial intelligence something that we have to have as a species moving forward to survive? What we say artificial intelligence depend rely on a super large amount of data. We've come so far, and in the next 40 years, researchers tell me the future of computing is limitless, but people, not machines, are in control. Should people be scared of this technology or embrace it? Because the technology is pretty incredible. The technology is pretty incredible, and people have some sort of uh, reason to, to be a little concerned, but really, these machines are very stupid. If you let them do what they do without monitoring them, then they're gonna cause damage. And, and then there is reason to be afraid. But if we just pay attention and don't let it just go, then I think we'll be fine. At the University of Florida with photojournalist Reed Moeller, Michael Paluska, ABC Action News.